Besaza M continues. So welcome back. This is that time of the show where we're asking you what top headlines are you waking up to this morning that are going to affect the way that you run your day or have already affected the way that it is that you're going to run your day. We keep on stressing this is the second day of the financial budget 2019-2020. So some of the fiscal measures that the government was pushing in in this year have already started taking effect. So now the question is, if you bet against uh, Senegal yesterday beating um, Kenya, how much did you win? Was it, did you get the full amount? How many people bet against Kenya and how much did you get? So if you didn't get the full amount, you have to know that that money is now getting taxed twice. That is, on placing your bet and number two, on your winnings. So the government gets to take a big chunk. And you have to know that now the government is also coming heavy on the betting farms in the country. In fact, as we wake up this morning, which is going to form the first story on our Metropole Review, is that 19 farms whose licenses expired in 2018 are not going to be renewed. This morning, I am joined by Feni Nyamunga. I'm joined by Enoch as we look at some of the top headlines this morning. Feni, good morning. Good morning, how are you? Good morning. So we are celebrating Alex's birthday. Yes, we are. <laughs> and we are not so sure how old is it, you know? <laughs> but we are not, but what we are sure about is not on the lower end, it's on the upper hand. <laughs> yes, yes. I've grown old. <laughs> With wisdom. So people yeah. say so. Okay, let's get back to the back end of this. Now, there are a lot of bills that are getting thrown at the betting companies in this country. I mean, it started way back when the government realized that in 2018, out of the 200 billion shillings that betting farms made in terms of profit, only 4 billion of these shillings went back to paying our taxes. So, and I just want to start with you this morning, because the development to this is that 19 farms whose licenses expired in 2018, the government is, has no intention of renewing them. I keep on asking this question, what is the government really trying to achieve in this? Because now, yes, we do know that now they're going to get taxed further. It's now within law. Nobody's contesting that. But you see, they're trying more and more measures to try and cap this. Now, 50 shillings, you could place a bet with 20 shillings. We've seen some farms actually advertise as low as 10 shillings or 20 shillings. You can actually place a bet. Now, that is unlawful. And I want you to respond from this point. We have two numbers they're working with. They're saying 76% of the youth in the country are into betting. But there's another number. 7 million Kenyans out of the 46 million, they're into betting. Those are two different contrasting numbers. Because when you talk about 76% of the youth, we do know the ratio that the youth take in this country. And then you say 7 million Kenyans are into betting. Which number are we working at? And for you, what do you think the solution to this could be? Uh, um, thank you so much, uh, Simba. Mm -hmm. There's just some clarification probably before I, I talk about uh, betting. Uh, the government, actually the laws were changed in such a way that the government has to pre present the finance bill in parliament yes. for approval mm -hmm. be before the start of the financial year, which was a contention when uh, the CS Treasury was actually reading the budget in parliament because he had not presented the, the finance bill because the government has no authority to tax or to implement the new measures without the passing of that bill in Parliament. So we're waiting to see when that can be yes. presented and, mm -hmm. and, and passed. Yes. Uh, on on, uh, on betting, <coughs> and I think we've talked about it here, I don't know why we demonize betting. Because it's, a, it's, it's part of the sport, and it's something that is accepted across the world. In any case, in Kenya, we allow people to smoke cigarettes, and we tax them. We allow people to drink beer, and we tax them. So we've never put measures to actually make it look like smoking cigarettes is illegal. Yes. What the government wants is to, every financial year, to in, in, increase the excess duty, which is actually sin, sin tax, mm -hmm. so that they can be able to make more from, uh, from those activities. Why can't we do the same for betting? Why are we trying to stifle the people who are into betting from, from it? In any case, has the government taken time to get their statistics right? Is the 200 billion profits... Or is it income yes. for that period? Uh -huh. How much are the betting companies generating? How much are they spending? How many people have they employed? 
how much are they spending on uh, on CSR uh, corporate social resp responsibility? Yes. Those are the things that we need to address. Mm -hmm. So instead of demonizing the betting companies, trying to make it look like it is what actually is ailing this country, we need to look for, as a country, as an economist, look for a way we can be able to work around the betting companies and make the best out of them. Yes. In terms of revenue for the government, mm -hmm. employment opportunities, and uh, of course, growth in the economy. Yes. In any case, it is the same, same government that are, is lying to us that we have employment in the country. So the people are betting, most of them are young, unemployed people. Okay. So if they created jobs, we could not be where we are right yes. now. Yes, I see you smiling, and I want you to I want you to respond from this perspective. Therefore, that fifty six percent of those people who bet yeah. they're from the lower income level, and I want you to respond to this point. Why are we demonizing betting? And I want you to factor in this point. There's another bill that says now if you bet through your phone, mm -hmm. there is two million fine that is coming your way. All right. So I guess me and Enoch have different points when it comes yes. to betting, mm -hmm. different points of view. Um, yes. So for my, in my understanding, it's not that, okay, for example, even alcohol, we have two types. We have the one that EABL sells, for example, and we have the Muratina. Yes. The government is trying to protect its people. So like you've seen the numbers that you're saying, most of the people who are betting are either young, meaning they don't even have jobs, or they are lower income. So what they've seen is most of these kind of people are the ones who are running to bet. So if you have this kind of, that's the level of desperation in there. So what they're saying is, we understand that these are the people who are betting. We understand that the people who are giving the betting industry this much money. Mm -hmm. So we put tax because these people are the same people who will be very sensitive to that kind of tax. Yes. So it's a level, it's trying to protect the people who are actually engaging in betting because some of them might not fully understand how much they're injuring themselves. Because if I tell you who's coming to work every day, that yes, you place 20 bob, but 20 bob five times will actually become 100 bob. But these people, that's not their understanding. They're thinking this 20 bob, even if it comes 500 in a week, is my opportunity to get 5 million. Yes. So that's, I think it's more of a protective measure. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and this is a $200 billion industry in Kenya, mm -hmm. sorry, shillings um, <coughs> industry in Kenya. Yes. The government is trying to raise money for 2019, 2020. And the, one of the ways that you would think for them to go is to go inside this area. But I wanted to talk about these two numbers that keep on getting hit in the face of Kenya. 76% of Kenyan youth are into baiting mm -hmm. that will make more than a half of the Kenyan population but the official statistic that we have therefore from KNBS is that seven million Kenyans are into baiting. Mm -hmm. So when you have these two numbers thrown in your face is the government trying by any means to make sure that this doesn't become so to say a flourishing industry in the country and is culture and i keep on asking this question is culture a good way for us to run out of a 200 billion shillings industry in kenya because the government could be looking ways could look into ways to get into that uh, you see for the government because we've been pushing for them to be able to expand the tax base yes instead of taxing the same same people they are now looking at betting because it's actually a new concept in kenya it has yes. not been here for for a long time and the government has this feeling and I again uh, blame the people at Treasury, they have this billing, feeling that there's so much money being made by the betting companies. They have not so, done so much in terms of audit to understand the figures. Because if they knew the figures, they could be telling us the figures, not some general 200 billion figures. Yes. Because these companies are operating in an environment whereby we have measures to actually audit these companies. <coughs> Once that is done, then we can be able to say, this is your profitability level, this is how much we want to get out of you. But, it, but again, going back to the, the issue that she has raised, we cannot be seen to tax the poor so that we can chase them away from something they are doing out of desperation. Yes. We have to have the right measures in place around the industry. Either declare it illegal altogether or make it legal like we have done others, then have very strict measures in terms of how they operate. And, of course, how they give back to the community yes. and how they pay taxes. Mm. That is the only way the government can be able to benefit out of this. In any case, if they say it's 76% of the 7 million, almost every young person is betting. Meaning people actually don't have jobs. Yes. Me and you may not be betting because we are so busy and we have a way we spend our money. But a young person who has been riding a Buddha Buddha the whole day, he has 300 shillings, he wants to have that money multiplied. Mm -hmm. And the only way is to try and put in a 20 shilling bet, hoping that he'll get the millions like he's seen on TV. Yes. But Funny. would you also say, for example, that the youth have more accessibility to online, and that's why they're putting a limit to how much can actually be bet. So 
like you're saying, it's a new industry yes. in Kenya. Mm -hmm. And what we've seen in Kenya, what usually happens is people go and then regulation follows. And then regulation follows. So what we're trying to do is <coughs> yes. kind of meet it halfway, mm -hmm. mitigate as much as we can, yes. because we see a lot of leakage and we're seeing many firms are taking advantage mm -hmm. of the fact that there's no regulation. Afani, there's a question that I want to ask you though. Yeah. Yes, now we do know that as per this morning, 19 firms whose license has expired in 2018, yes. and they, I don't think they're really going to be renewed because if it's a good business, then once your license expires, yeah. then people would come and renew your license. But yes. We are talking about job losses yes. in regions of 3,000 plus job losses for people being into this business. I'm saying, when you're trying to sanitize this industry, therefore, aren't there are better ways that you use to approach to sanitize it? Because we have to look at the other side as well. Yeah. So we don't have situations like now what's happening over the university side where we have more than 27,000 jobs that are at stake just because we want to sanitize it now and okay. we have to do it. All right, so I understand where you're coming from yes. in terms of sanitization. But you must also understand many of these firms, they're not Kenyan firms. Mm -hmm. And because of that... I think regardless. Because that loophole, they're using it to wash money. Aren't they're, we, aren't they're we bringing preaching, a lot more. Aren't we preaching employment yes. and job creation? But what if, for example, I yes. come and I do something very illegal and I tell you it's in the... It's in the it's in, and I put it under the roof of job employment. Mm -hmm. Do you know any illegality can actually be under job employment? Yes. Yeah. So that means I'm hiding an evil and I'm telling you I'm giving you jobs. So is that, am I really trying to protect you or am I finding a roof under which where I'm, I'm able to work with you and you're saying, oh yes, I'm getting a job. Yes. However, it's, it's more profitable to me. So am I actually creating an evil or a good? That is another assumption mm -hmm. that betting companies are being used to wash money. In Kenya, people use matatus, use restaurants and so many <laughs> other things to wash money. But those are yeah. Kenyans. So yeah. we, can, we, we can actually yes. not assume that people are using betting companies to wash money. We can't make that assumption. Those are people have, that is an idea that someone genuinely came with. Sportspersa came into the country. They shared the idea with the Kenyans. People have the idea of betting. Yes. People are actually winning. All they need to do is just mm. operate within the laws that have been set. So we should throw it back to parliament to set a law that can be able to guide us on how people can go around betting. Yes. What we don't want, and you, you said about it, is we don't want to wake up every morning to regulation. Just because we feel we have to regulate. Yes. So like MTSA does. You wake up today, this is illegal. The next day it is actually legal. We need something that is long term. Let's have a bill passed in parliament that regulates the betting industry. The betting industry. But let mm -hmm. the betting industry be. Let people operate like they are, as profitable as they may be. Yes. And I've told you before here. In fact, the people who should be banned in this country are <laughs> banks and insurance companies. <laughs> because they make massive profits. Yes. Yeah by taking advantage of us. Yes. So let the betting companies be. But let them, of course, operate within the law yes. as it is. All right. Yes. I just, I just, I, I'm just begging, Fanny. I know you want to come back to that. Yeah. But I'm just begging for us to really move on to the next big issue Fair in enough. the country right now. Yeah. Which, yes, I know we're still mourning the passing on of uh, Bob Kalimore of Safaricom. But I just want us to draw ourselves to some of the news that we're seeing right now, uh, because they refuse to respond to what next now. But we do know that the news now, that according to Reuters, and I'm going to quote, that said that there has been a vote that has been elected, therefore, by the board to take over. In fact, that was an already done process, because as we keep on developing now, that the developing factors into this story. Mm -hmm. And they're saying, but, as we speak right now, and I'm quoting Reuters, <coughs> is that there's already some infighting on exactly who is supposed to take over and under what criteria. Now, we do know that the government actually wishes or wants a Kenyan to succeed. Oh. Bob Colimo, that was the plan, mm -hmm. isn't it? And that has been the plan, and it's known to many Kenyans now. All right. Now, the question, therefore, is what next for? Safaricom. I just want us to take our eyes and look at uh, one analyst that we uh, be there, who's our analyst here at Marcus today, and see exactly her point of view. And from there, we will come back and then talk about what next for Bob Colimo and uh, sorry for Safaricom after Bob Colimo. Let's take a look. In the morning, the country has been hit by a very shocking and sad news of the sudden demise of Bob Colimo, who was the CEO of Safaricom TLC. So many questions have been raised left, right, and center, and one of the key questions is what is next for Safaricom? Joining me to have this conversation is Mbida Mwema, who is the host of Markets Today and also financial analyst. Thank you very much, Mbida, for making time. This is a very shocking state, not just for Kenyans, but for Safaricom. But before we discuss what is the need for Safaricom, let's just begin by contextualizing where is Safaricom currently at in terms of how they're performing in the market. So where it's at today, it's um, trading slightly above 28 shillings. 
in the market today we actually didn't see much activity happening. Mm -hmm. It still remains a top trade that's stock. Mm -hmm. When you speak to the traders and try to get a sense of what an investor is talking about in the market, they, we're not hearing jitters or anything. Mm -hmm. Largely because he was unwell, he had been unwell. This was an unfortunate um, um, occurrence with him passing away the way he did. Mm -hmm. But then I don't think the market is saying now that the leader of Safaricom, the largest trader stock on the market, the highest market capitalization has passed away, let's get out of the stock. That's mm -hmm. not what we are hearing. What direction is Safaricom likely to take in terms of leadership? You have to always remember that the CEO, he bears the vision, his responsibility is to deliver the vision of the board. So the board says what we want to do. His work is to implement that vision and mm -hmm. to ensure that that vision is scaled down and communicated to the different people. Mm -hmm. So when we begin to look at the people underneath uh, Mr. Colimo, so Satish, Joseph, and Sylvia, and I'm sure there are many others, when you begin to look at them and what they have been doing, then in a way you're saying that there was the CEO role, but now that the CEO has left, it doesn't mean that work doesn't continue. So there's the emotional element that we have lost somebody who was dear to us. We've lost him to a disease and mm -hmm. it could have happened to anyone. But then there's always the element which is very cold and brutal truth that a company is a going concern. It always lives beyond you. Mm -hmm. So you could be seated in this um, chair tomorrow. Somebody else could potentially come and ask you the same questions and vice versa. This could be somebody else seated here. Mm -hmm. So the element of corporate law, as long as it's a going concern, it keeps going. Mm -hmm. And it just has to find a way to reassign resources, mm -hmm. whether it's capital, whether it's labor, whatever resource it is, to be able to enhance and deliver on the vision. What would you say will be the upfront task of the new CEO that will take over? I think the key thing would be regulation. Regulation, really. Because when you look at the last statement when um, the board extended Mr. Bob Collimo's term, two things, regulation, operating environment. Operating environment, I look at it in terms of the tough economic um, cycle that we're going through. There's a slowdown in businesses, increased redundancies, liquidity and um, consumption is not as ripe as it was maybe two or three years ago. Mm -hmm. When you look at it in that way, then it's um, the, the challenge is for Safaricom to create new products and to enhance the touch points of its consumers so that it ensures that it's still growing mm -hmm. in terms of its top life and its bottom life. Mm -hmm. So they have more control because it's just rejigging or finding out how do we... All right, that is exactly uh, our analyst here for Marcus today. That is Mbide going through exactly what she thinks is next for Safaricom after Bob Colimo. So I'm just going to start with you, Fanny. Yeah. yeah, all right. We do know that Safaricom now, as we know, commands more than 60% of the market share when it comes to telecommunication business in the country is actually more than 62.4% as we speak. Yeah. Any worry that now that Bob Collimo is not there and we've not had that what you call a smooth a transition that would be good for everybody in the economy and say that he did this, he retired and then he left. Mm -hmm. Would you think that now their market share, isn't it, would be a bit shaken? Is there anything that would this situation they're going through right yeah. now, check the market share or they're already there, they don't need to worry about that. Well, I can't say they don't have to worry about it, but I don't think it's their first point of concern. Yes. Because what they also did was a good thing was that they entrenched themselves in the Kenyan culture. Mm -hmm. So they didn't just bring the Vodafone name, they actually, even most of the adverts, there's a lot of, we are part of who Kenya is. So whether or not he, yes, we do miss him and we do know that he did a lot to support that. However, Safaricom, it's very hard to mention Safaricom without someone thinking Kenya. So they have literally put them, entrenched themselves in the Kenyan culture. Yes. So I do not feel it's one of their first key points of concern. Yes. Yeah. And uh, this is the thing that I want to ask you, and I want you to talk to me from that economic point of view. I mean, Safaricom have 62.4% um, market share right now. And Finney is of the idea, no, don't worry about that. And be the sense, look, what about right now is the legislation part that we really need to worry about. Okay, so would you therefore think the next boss who's coming in would be just a political boss who's going to make sure that you're not going to wake up the next day and then what you hear is now M-Pesa is no longer a telecommunication business, it's now viewed as a bank because we know we have those bills that are waiting for Safaricom. Would you say the legislation is the key issue that will be for the incoming boss? Uh, definitely, legislation is actually a key issue in mm -hmm. telecommunication yes. because it's almost also a new industry to us, especially when it comes to innovation. Things are happening every day that are catching up with us in terms of uh, legislation. And Safaricom has been at the forefront. For, uh, having worked in the telecommunication industry for the last 11 years or so, mm -hmm. I can tell you Safaricom is bigger than people think it is. It has a very good corporate culture. 
uh, and a very good uh, system of, uh, of governance within the organization. And the death of Bob Colum, of course, as sad as it is, may not really affect the company so much in terms of operations. But people are watching. And what they want to understand is, are we now ready to hand over the company to a Kenyan CEO? Yes. And for me, I say yes. And here is why. Sylvia Mlinge, she's a top executive there. Yes. Vodafone actually appointed her the CEO of Vodacom Tanzania. Yes. Meaning they believed in her capabilities. As much as Tanzania, of course, refused to give her a visa, uh, a work permit to work there, this is her opportunity now. She's in Safaricom. We no longer have a CEO at Safaricom. We are pushing to have a Kenyan CEO. She is the right person yes. to take over. Mm -hmm. And we are actually watching to see whether they can be able to, di to divert away from that. And don't forget that the government doesn't have so much in terms of control of how Safaricom runs. Vodacom have a big say. So in terms of getting a political figure as the CEO, that might not happen because Voda Voda Vodafone knows that they are making so much from this country and they expect the business to continue expanding, so they may not want to put the business in the hands of someone who can actually be able to kill it within a very short time. Yes. Yes. All right, Fanny, um, it traded level yesterday when you looked at uh, how Safaricom was trading at uh, the NSC yesterday. It was a big level. Yeah. And we, you could say that we can attribute that to the news that we received yesterday morning. But I want to ask you this question, therefore. This talk about a Kenyan CEO taking over, yeah. isn't it? Do you think it's really pertinent? And if yes, indeed, that that's the embargo that we had, because now we're getting um, news from all sides of that. No, no, they added the one year. In fact, they might have known that Bob Colimo was not going to pretty much go through his tenure, mm -hmm. but they did this one year just to settle dust, you know, push, push it in front, so that we can actually settle the dust on this succession talk. Mm -hmm. Do you think it will be something that we might have to look at in the next few days coming? Um, I think so. Yes. Because whether you like it or not, like he's saying, they do pay, play a big part in our economy. They do have a big say in how Kenya, dry, um, Kenya is driven, especially in the stock exchange. Mm -hmm. So I understand why we as Kenyans would like a representative or like a Kenyan yes. on the board or as CEO. However, even as Bob, Bob Collimo said himself, you have to get the right person. Because it, it's still the top, one of the top trading um, stock in the NSC. Yes. But if you get someone who's unable to continuously innovate, mm -hmm. continuously drive the vision that has been in Safaricom, we will also suffer. Yes. So it's very important and I think they've also been managing the situation and that's why you didn't, we didn't see um, change in the stock um, pricing mm -hmm. because they have been managing the story since he took leave when he was unwell. Yes. So the people have been continuously asking what is the criteria, how will you this, how will you establish and how will you make sure that this person, even once they come in, will be, will be able to deliver yes. on what Bob Collim already started. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's something that's very key. However, I also feel that we also have to be open because he also prepared us in when he said it has to be the right person. Yes. Not the right nationality, <coughs> not the right color, just the right person. Yes. Yeah. And I want to, uh, just when you look at the talk that is really around that, yeah. There were two CEOs. Remember the one year that uh, he left for treatment um, in, in 2017, isn't it? Yeah. There were two CEOs that were appointed to see to his roles. Are we supposed to read anything into that? Or let's just close <coughs> our eyes on that and say, I mean, they appointed two people, yes, to take over or to assume his duties, in as much as they said they were talk, they're, they're doing different roles at that capacity. Are we supposed to read anything into that in terms of the succession rest? Mm. Or it's just an event, I mean. Mm -hmm. What I'll say is that when, when you have a CEO yes. who is of course left mm -hmm. uh, temporarily, ideally you look at the seniority in terms of uh, the ranking in the management to come in and, and take, uh -huh. know someone who can be able to yes. take in acting capacity. Mm -hmm. So of course you don't expect them to get someone from a lower rank to come and, and, and take over because they know it's actually temporary. Yes. So we cannot read so much into that. But I can tell you, Vodafone may actually favor an Unkenyan CEO because they have done that before. But then again, as Kenyans, we have to speak out. Remember, we've had this discussion for the last two weeks or so regarding our relationship with Tanzania over the same issue of jobs and, you know, employment. And that's why I brought the issue of uh, Sylvia Mlinge. And that is why that discussion will continue until Safaricom appoints a CEO. Yes. People are actually watching that we have gotten an opportunity. Tanzania was selfish enough to say, look, we actually have a local who can take over at Vodafone. We don't need a Kenyan. Now we are here as Kenyans and we have this opportunity to actually appoint a CEO. Yes. Are we going to see the same? Mm -hmm. Or we will expect to say, fine, let Vodafone take control and get an Kenyan to take over. But either way, 
Safaricom, with the kind of systems they've had for the last 20 or so years, whoever gets appointed as the CEO will actually have to look uh, down at uh, his managers to be able to take uh, instructions or, of course, directions on how the company goes forward. Yes. So he may not bring in so much in terms of changes. Mm -hmm. The system may continue as it is. And, of course, Safaricom and the telecommunication industry are watching keenly to see what Parliament done, does in terms of legislation because that is going to affect how the business operates going forward. Yes. I'll just beg for us to move on to the next big issue again. It's yeah. been a perennial issue in Kenya. Mm -hmm. I mean, we cannot complete a financial year, a budget year, without Kenya talking about we have a crisis when it comes to maize in this country. Yeah. But we were in the street yesterday and we saw <coughs> a bit of views from very passionate Kenyans. Let's just take a look at that and then we see how we can react to that. When you're listening to the budget tabling for 2019-2020, the import duty for all the commodities from ESC was not wavered, is actually still there. Mm -hmm. So even as our mailers find solution to this, at the back of our mind, they still do know that even if I go get maize from Tanzania, from Uganda, from Rwanda, whatever it is available, I still have to get taxed and then come and try fight with the market uh, rates that we have in the country. When you look at food security, which is a pillar that this government is really lying on, and it's been three years now, down the line as they've been trying to achieve it, but year in, year out, we've been talking about food crisis, especially this commodity in the country. Where is the truth not coming out? And what are we not doing okay? All right, so I guess this also comes to what he's talking about in terms yes. of timing. Mm -hmm. So like they said, it's part of their four, the big four. Yes. So it's something that everyone is watching. So us as Wananchi, it is our duty to ask the, the, the government. You said food will be there at all times. You said that we would be able to afford this food. And at the same time, we also know that these are the cycles that happen every year in the Kenyan economy. Yes. So what we're asking them is, how are you going to manage this? How are you going to make sure that we're not constantly crying because everything is too expensive? Because the import bill has always been there. So are they going to put in subsidies? What are they going to do? But we have to apply the pressure to them and throw it back at them because that is what they promised the Kenyans. Yes. Yeah. All right, uh, Enoch, I just want us to get into this. Now, the Food Reserve Board, which I know me and you have already spoken about this on this program. I mean, when we started, we the, there was a disagreement between the Ministry of Agriculture and the Food Reserve Board, which says, well, we don't like the way you're going ahead and announcing that now we're going to release the cheap maize, the 2,390 <coughs> shillings, 90 kg of bag of maize, which we do know that was supposed to be released just months ago, which they said, yes, a couple of millers were collecting this maize that the government was releasing. But now it's coming out that they only have one million bags left, which some are saying can only last the country for the next two or three weeks, which begs the question, why are we not getting told the truth? Because this is a new information that is coming in light of this crisis now. I mean, why not saying the truth? If they only have one million, why couldn't they say that a long time ago? Because Millers were saying, we don't think you have the seven million that you are saying. It's now coming out true. Indeed, they had just one million. No, we've had issues in the Ministry of Agriculture. Yes. And, uh, and how the National Serious Board has been operating. Yes. So information has not come in handy in terms of what we have so that we can, of course, have comfort as Kenyans that we are covered within that given period. But having said that, we, as a country, we now need to focus elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Can we actually focus on other sources of food other than maize? Is it true, Enoch, in between this crisis? Would you think Honest, honestly, you think it's Simba, time for Simba, us to start doing we, that? We've talked about it here. Yes. Look at our, how our land is now. Mm -hmm. The population has grown over time, but the land is the same. So if we don't invest in irrigation, irrigation and other new methods of agriculture, we are faced with a situation whereby Production remains the same. The, the, the population has grown. 
we actually have more and more issues in terms of diseases, we have drought and so many other things. Mm -hmm. So as a country, we have to focus elsewhere, but that is long term. Mm -hmm. The short term now is for the government to be able to, of course, ensure that Kenyans have food at the right price. Yes. Because inflation is actually affecting us. But how do we go about this? There's a lot of corruption, of course, that goes on. In, on how maize is imported. Yes. We've seen hoarding happening, mm -hmm. where people have purchased maize, they keep it knowing that at one point, the government will come crying out that we actually don't have maize. Yes. Then at that point, they can be able to sell their maize out. If those issues are not sorted out on how we transfer the product from the farmer to the cereals board, to the miller, we'll forever have these issues. But the other issue I want to mention is that we cannot address this, uh, the issue of uh, the scarcity through the budget. The government, the government normally does that in a special way, by giving subsidies when they feel it is necessary. Yes. Because we don't, have to, we don't want to have a, an open check for people to import maize to the country. So at one point, probably this month or next month, you will see the CS Treasury saying, we are granting out licenses for people to be able to bring a given number of bags into, into the, the country. country. But that's the problem that I'm, I'm finding. When you look at it, we, we, we're sort of reacting. Every time this crisis, and we know we're getting into a crisis, yeah. and we expect an announcement soon. But when we have a budget supposed to take care of the country for the next one year, yeah. and then that in that budget, then you see that even the input duty that is supposed to be levied on this mm -hmm. is assumed. And then we run midway, when we run into this crisis, then you find, uh, um, I think we need now to overlook what we said so we can mitigate this crisis. Don't you think that this reaction point of view that we're taking to this issue is the one that has kept us here year in, year out? Um, I think there are two different um, issues if you think yes. about it because the financial bill is supposed to carry out for a full year. Yes. Right? And mm -hmm. this is the first year of the, the big four. So, yes. so if they put in the financial bill and, and they let the subsidies, they let the import bill stay, that carries us for a full year. Anything yes. that they do in terms of subsidies is short term. Which is why even what he's, uh, what Enoch is bringing out is that there are long-term measures that the government is already working on, we hope, with the big four agendas. Yes. However, in between, to make sure that the common wananchi is taken care of, they will have to step in. And we expect them to step in because even in the first quarter, with the, when the short rains were already delayed, we already knew there was going to be a short supply. Mm -hmm. So this is something we expected. Yes. So the thing is, how are they going to deal with it? Especially, and the question would also be, is the cartel part of the government? Mm -hmm. Because they're the ones who do things like holding and with, withholding um, the, the maize from the people. So are they part of the government or is the government bigger than the cartel? Yes. So those are things that will also come out. Okay. Yes. I just want us to move swiftly to <coughs> the next headline, which is a big issue as well, because now bank, the banking sector has been on the headlines just a couple of days ago. And I want to ask you this before, Fanny, just on, on a general outlook before I ask Enoch what he thinks about this. Number one, when you look at the margin acquisitions that we've been experiencing in the banking sector, what do you say? that this is the banking sector trying to readjust itself with the regulation now that is coming from uh, the Central Bank of Kenya because some CEOs have been crying, look, the banking sector is overly regulated mm. and they're trying to adjust themselves and command more profitability. Um, it's all about commanding profitability, but when you see there's a watchdog coming, you can yes. either align yourself or wait mm -hmm. for them to come and tell you yes. what to do. So what the mergers and acquisitions we're seeing, it's like people picking and choosing. Mm -hmm. So it's um, yeah, pick, it's like the lemon sort of thing. So people pick and choose what suits them before the government comes and starts telling them, do this, do that. Yes. So that's something we expected to happen, especially when the regulation started um, affecting them, when the, the bill capping. And like Enoch said, the banking sector has reaped quite a lot from Kenya. Yes. So yeah, we needed a watchdog. <laughs> Enoch, which is your next question, pretty much, uh, because now um, CMA has, given, um, a green, has been given a green light now um, to pursue the directors of Imperial Bank, which just went under receivership just a couple of years ago, but a month before that, they had issued a 200 billion shillings bond. Good time for us to start talking about having lesser banks in the country, so that now we don't have these issues happening? No, I think we still go back to the issues that we had. We always wait for a problem to occur. Yes. Then we go back to which law can we be able to put in place yes. to sort out this problem. Mm -hmm. Because we've had emergence of banks, some of them small banks with five customers in the country. And that is where the problem has been. Problems have not hit very big banks. Problem have hit banks that have been operating in a way that they've been serving a, small, a, a very specific sector in the economy mm -hmm. and you don't know what happens there. So with the new laws that we have and of course the issue of capital and the rest and the mergers that are happening, I really like it because we actually want banks that can be able to serve us. Mm -hmm. 
with the right products. Yes. Of course, again, as shareholders, maintain prof profitability. So when you see banks merging like NIC and CBA, it was a very good thing. Because these are two banks with different uh, ideas in terms of how they engage the public. Yes. One focuses on the corporate, another one focuses on the loans. Mm -hmm. So when they come together, they can be able to offer us more as Kenyans in terms of a, a wide range of products. And of course, we want to see the products that can be able to suit especially the SMEs. Yes. So merging is the best thing going forward because we, we don't need to have 50 banks yes. that are not serving our interests. But again, the issues of regulation have to be addressed. Yes. Right from the things that the directors are doing to how some of the banks have been operating in the country mm -hmm. and of course leading to what happened like what we saw in uh, Chess Bank. Yes. Fanny, as we, as we clear this conversation this morning, it's now emerged that 13 years to when K, um, Imperial Bank actually went under receivership, that some of the directors in the banks had found through front front, front led boys and all that managed to free 34 billion shillings into their personal businesses and investments. 34 billion mm. in a span of 30, 13 years, quite a lot of money. So, would you say, therefore, that in some way or another, that our regulatory bodies in this country they are also sort of coming to realization that yes, over regulation sort of deep regulation or strict regulation is the way to go for the banking sector in the country. And I want you to talk to me, therefore, do you think that this would eventually therefore affect the performance of the banking sector in the country? I, um, so I agree in terms of CMA's point of view and how they're approaching it, because yes. whether we like it or not, there's a corporate law and there's you as an individual. Mm -hmm. So many people have found the cover, the roof be beneath the corporate, because you're always a different entity. So the directors are the ones who make the big decisions and they're the ones who determine where the money is being moved. And so it's important that they're the ones who are held accountable. Yes. And whenever there's a corporation and there's no one underneath who's held accountable, we have always seen that people find loopholes. Mm -hmm. So I am 100% behind CMA's approach. All right. Yeah. This is the last issue that we have here. I'm just going to ask you. Just yes. something yes. before we, we, mm -hmm. we finish on that issue. Yes. CMA can only do so much, yeah. including just banning them from holding directors' positions in the country. We want to see the agencies in the country of post pursuing them. Yes. Because those are criminal elements who've actually fleeced the money. Mm -hmm. And again, on a lighter note, 34 billion shillings over 13 years That's is not a lot of money. Would you say How so? much do we lose <laughs> in the damn saga within two years? I mean, <laughs> relativity. Yes. 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 All right. The last question, I don't think we'll have time to discuss about it. So, Fanny, I'm just going to put it outside there. Yeah. Do you think Kenya is headed in the right direction? Wow. I say in a few things, yes. No, yes. No. In a few <laughs> things, in, in a few things, yes. Because few days are, are we heading in the right direction? No. No, we are not. <laughs> yes. All right. This is the okay. research that Infotruck did just the other day. I think we're going to talk about this next All and right. see the reasons in which Kenyans are talking about their country. Are we headed in the right direction? In fact, that's a good way for us to end the conversation this morning. So we take it online. Hashtag Business AM. Are you? in agreement with Fanny that the Kenya is headed in the right direction, overall that is, and are you in agreement with Enoch that Kenya we're in the hotbed of trouble? All right, with that, we end the conversation this morning here on Business AM, but remember, the conversation courses online. Hashtag Business AM. My name is Simba Elijah Charles Kiyagi. I've been joined this morning by Fanny Nyamanga from Neighbor Capital and Enoch Munari this morning as we settle the dust. This morning, Marcus Today is up next.